Mr Hodge, old habits die very hard. I say 11.40, I come back at 11.40. I should get out of those old habits, I suspect. We're all uh, here, Commissioner. <laughs> yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, the first witness is Mr Curry. Thank you, Mr Curry. Would you prefer to uh, take an oath or make an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Do you mind standing then, please, Mr Curry? I solemnly and sincerely I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you very much do sit down yes mr hodge thank you commissioner your name is philip george curry correct and you've provided your address to the commission i have and you've received a summons to give evidence today. I have. You have that with you? I do. Commissioner, I tender the summons. Exhibit uh, 3.3 .3 will be summons to Mr. Curry. Mr. Curry, you've prepared a witness statement for the commission. I have. And the, the relevant witness statement, I'll come to this in a moment, is one dated the 18th of May, 2018. Yes. And again, you've got that a copy of that here with I you do. today. Commissioner, I tender Mr Curry's witness statement dated Exhibit the 18th of May 2018. Exhibit 3.4, uh, witness statement, Curry, 18 May 18, and its exhibits. Mr Curry, you're a principal of Cameron Ralph Curry? Yes. And sorry, could you just, just because it's being recorded, could you speak sure. up a little bit? Thank you, yeah. Mr Curry. And can you tell the Commission what services your firm provides? Uh, we provide governance services, so governance advice, design of governance systems, board evaluations, director evaluations, and also uh, advice in the space of what loosely called self-regulatory activity, complaints handling, external disputes resolution, codes of conduct, etc. And your firm has conducted a number of independent reviews of financial service, financial sector external dispute resolution bodies? Yes. And not just in Australia, but also overseas? Also overseas, Canada and, the, and New Zealand. And what is your background, Mr Curry? Uh, relevant to this, my background is uh, I worked for the Australian Securities Commission and the Securities and Investments Commission for around nine years. I see. And how long have you been a principal of Cameron Ralph Curry? Uh, since 2002. Thank you. And you were commissioned to carry out a review of the Code of Banking Practice? I was. And I mentioned earlier that the correct statement is dated the 18th of May 2018. We surprised you a little bit on Friday of last week by giving you a new draft of the Code. Yeah. And so what you've been provided with is the most recent draft of the code that we have that's presently under consideration by ASIC. And you've had a look at that. I have had a look at that, yeah. And I think you've updated some of your views based on what's been your review of the new code or the further version of the code. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Now, what I wanted to do was to just talk through to begin with the process that you went through in reviewing the code as it was in 2016. It was back then about the middle of 2016 that the Austra then named Australian Bankers Association approached you to review the code. Yes, that's right. And at that stage, the current version of the code was the 2013 code. Yep, that's right. And your engagement was publicly announced at the beginning of July 2016. That's right, the 7th, I think. And ultimately, your finalised report was delivered on the, I think you say substantially finalised on the 31st of January 2017. Correct, yeah. There'd been a short extension given had there to produce the report? Yes, we had promised to do, uh, do our best to make it December 31st, which we couldn't make in the end and asked for an additional month to complete the report. And in terms of the approach that you took to reviewing the code, was there, was there an initial process that you had in mind, what you would try to do? 
Look, we, uh, ha having worked with the uh, disputes resolution schemes extensively, we're familiar with some of the, the uh, points of contention around consumer protection in the space. Uh, and we had hoped to uh, use as much evidence as possible to settle some of those arguments. So we had hoped to get uh, data from the banks and from other sources that would, would help to uh, uh, provide us with evidence-based resolution of some of the contentious issues. As it turned out, uh, that data didn't end up um, working out to, to help us as much as we would have hoped. So uh, the... Um, within a couple of months it was evident that we would need to use a bit of a different approach. And what was the different approach that you adopted? We had originally been asked to uh, review the code uh, from the perspective of what stakeholders wanted from banks and what would help restore trust in the banking industry. Uh, and in the absence of, of compelling precise data on a, a lot of the issues, uh, we just uh, retreated back to that logical equation, what are stakeholders asking for, what would be reasonable for the banks to offer, you know, on our, on our recommendation. I see. And I think you say in your statement that there was a, an emphasis placed on the importance of or a, a particular way in which the code needed to be approached in order to achieve that that trust or the rebuilding of trust? Could you just explain that to the Commissioner? My, uh, uh, I suppose, initial uh, criticisms of the existing code at the time were that it was really written from the point of view of the banks very much. And the language wasn't accessible for consumers. It certainly wa it wasn't accessible for small business. It wasn't clear in many cases really what the promise was. And we took the code to be a document that was a promise from the industry to its customers and that the language should really be much more uh, framed in terms of those uh, what customers should expect from the banks. And could you explain the, the idea that you explained about paragraph six of your statement that changes or the recommendations would need to be significant or transformational to overcome scepticism? Uh, in our um, in very uh, initial conversations with uh, stakeholders as we began the process, a number of uh, people put to us that, uh, and they subsequently echoed this in their sub written submissions, that there would have to be quite a leap in terms of the code's framing and the code's provisions for it to impact on uh, their trust in the banks. That if the, at the time the messages on the uh, ABA website were we are listening and we are improving and people m quoted those directly to us and said this will have to be transformational in nature to have that impact that the, the ABA are looking for. And that was another thing then that you were taking in mind in assessing what recommendations you ought to make? Indeed. All right. Now, what I want to do then is work through a few particular issues in relation to small, in relation to small businesses and the way in which the code deals with small businesses. The first is the definition of what is a small business. And in your statement, you refer to that as a threshold issue. Mm. Again, you just need to say, just... Yes. Yep. And can you just tell the commissioner what that threshold issue is? Look, the, the, the law uh, doesn't really provide a huge number of protections for small businesses in their, in their dealing with banks in lending and so forth. So uh, the code is quite an important vehicle for protection for small business. Uh, it already, in 2013, extended some protections to small business they wouldn't otherwise have received. And so the question of who is a small business and who would be caught by the code uh, becomes pretty important as a starting position. Uh, in other countries, uh, there are quite different definitions of what is a small business. Uh, they more frequently distinguish between a micro enterprise and small to medium enterprise and so on. So um, we had already encountered a number of arguments that would uh, 
tend to, would argue to exclude businesses on on the basis of their scale or complexity or sophistication. So we thought it was pretty important to just get clear about who we are talking about in the first place. And did the member banks have a particular approach to the definition of small business that they presented to you? There were a couple of things going on at the time which I think have affected the, the position that the banks put to us. The 2013 code had nothing more than an employment test in terms of whether someone was to be treated as a small business. Um, the, uh, there were practical issues outside of the code which go to, uh, which you mentioned earlier, FOS's jurisdiction or the CIO's jurisdiction. Um, and so I think these were influencing the way the banks responded to it. But we, we had previously come to a view that the, the cap on whether a business qualified as a small business under the, under the code and also when they went to an external dispute resolution service could certainly be higher than it was cast at the time. Um, we accepted the argument that the banks put to us that at some point uh, as you go up the scale of a small business, you no longer use standard form contracts, uh, the businesses are more sophisticated, uh, the terms of the credit may be more complex and so on. And so there is a point at which what's appropriate to a small business uh, should stop and um, you know, the normal uh, provisions in the law apply. We just thought that should be higher. Uh, and so when we put quite early in the piece, put the proposition of a $5 million um, cap on the um, on qualifying as a small business, uh, the uh, industry came back uh, with a new proposal for defining small business fairly early in the piece. And I just want to just break that down a little bit. When you talk about a $5 million cap, you mean a $5 million cap on the value of a facility that would be covered correct. by the code, is that That's right? That's correct. Yep. Okay. As opposed to a cap on annual revenue or anything like that. Yeah, or, or a cap. As it turned out, the industry's proposition was to retain the employment test, this is during the review, retain the employment test to put a cap of a total of $3 million, uh, $3 million of credit exposure for a, a company uh, and a, a $10 million turnover test as well. So the industry at that point were, um, I think, uh, pretty keen to re rein in the definition of small business. And did you have a, any discussion or receive any submissions from the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman about the definition? Uh, indeed, the, the um, Small Business uh, Ombudsman put a submission to our review, uh, making one point, which was the employment test should be 100 uh, employees without any complication over manufacturing and so on, which would line up with the Small Business Ombudsman's jurisdiction. And what about the value of facilities to be covered? That wasn't um, part of the test, okay. from her submission at any rate. Yeah. I understand. And in terms of the view that you took about $5 million, can you, oh, we know obviously ultimately your recommendation was that it'd be $5 million. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain to the Commissioner how you arrived at $5 million? Well, I, I have to say we had sort of come to that view much earlier. We did the independent review of the Financial Ombudsman Service in 2013 and uh, the issue arose then about the Ombudsman's jurisdiction and we had uh, interviewed a number of people in the industry, in the Ombudsman Service, consumer advocates and so on around the um, where the limit ought to be uh, and had examined a number of case files as part of our review and had come to the view that it could certainly be much higher and we thought $5 million was reasonable at that time, made a recommendation to that effect for the FOS independent review and we found in the course of the banking review that, um, well, we agreed with ourselves really. The, uh, <laughs> we didn't find anything that caused us to think differently about that. And I should just clarify, when you say we, you had somebody who was assisting you with carrying out the review, is that right? I did, yeah. Okay. And when you say we, you mean you were the leader, but the you and the person assisting you. My so colleagues, right? yeah. That's okay. right. And I just want to understand one point, which is about the that sort of casting the line at $5 million and your review of the case files. Did they tell you anything about 
the complexity of loans or did you form any judgment about the complexity of loans above and below that threshold? Look, that, that's a, a difficult thing to do with any certainty. Our uh, feeling, having looked at them, was that th there's certainly great variation in terms of, of the uh, loans on either side of that line, but most of the loans below five we felt were pretty uh, really aimed at the unsophisticated small business, which we thought was the purpose of the code. Uh, once you got over five million, a significant number of the loans were more complex than that and, and really aimed at a different market, we thought. So. And during the course of your consultations, presumably you put to the member banks this idea of a $5 million limit? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. And what was the response to that $5 million limit? Industry indicated they weren't happy with it. They thought it was too high um, and uh, indicated to us that they had come up with a, a different way of, of framing it that had the multiple tests in it, as described before. So test for total exposure, test for turnover and a test for employment. And we'll come to some of the other tests in a moment, but just in relation to the to choosing between $5 million or $3 million. What was the rationale as you understood it? Obviously, you ultimately didn't accept it, but what was the rationale for bringing it lower down to $3 million? Uh, look, we understood the bank's position was, uh, was really based around their current practices. So we, we, we heard evidence that they structure internally uh, different divisions or sections of the bank um, largely on the strength of the amount of money involved. And so some banks would have an upper limit of a million dollars and loans would be dealt with by a different area other than the retail section, others three million and so on. So uh, we got the impression that a big factor for the banks was just the internal organisation and, and how they manage their own compliance and, and risk management internally. Um, I think the banks said to us that they felt that loans became more complex above that $3 million. Um, and I think they also, another argument put to us was that if the, if the provisions for uh, protection of small business increased banks' risk, that they would, um, the availability of loans would, would reduce and potentially the cost would increase uh, if those protections were, were too onerous. I see. But in the end, having considered those various arguments, that wasn't the view no. that you took? No, we didn't, we didn't take that view. Uh, it, it doesn't take very long looking at examples of uh, small business loan files to see that uh, um, the zeros can come on quite quickly without changing whether a uh, small business is a sophisticated operation or not. That is, a loan for $50,000 is versus a loan for $500,000 versus a loan for $5 million. Indeed, uh, that, that there were many that, that were uh, really targeted at, at the classic small business, unsophisticated operator, but there's significant amounts of money involved. And now then the other thing that you referred to is this idea of, of extra tests in relation to what qualifies as a small business loan. I, I may have misunderstood this, but your initial instinct, w would it have been limited to the monetary cap without any other qualifications on what constituted a small business? Look, we, we uh, thought, uh, this, we, we agreed with the Small Business Ombudsman's proposition that a simpler employment test would make it easier for small business to know whether they were in or out. So we began from that point. The $5 million was really, we proposed it as a protection for the banks because there's no uh, upper limit in the 2013 code. So there was a protection for banks to say once it got beyond five, these provisions would, would evaporate, would no longer apply. Uh, and we, the banks also put to us that there could be gaming of the limit with, with 100 employees and corporate groups could put their, uh, divide their employees up into groups of 99, for example, in order to um, gain protections that they ought not gain. 
so we put in an additional qualifier as protection for the banks to simply say that if it was a corporate group, then the total number of employees in the group would be what you would count. Right. Now, you've seen, you've seen two different drafts of the code that was submitted to ASIC. You, I think when you prepared an original statement, you'd only seen the, the draft that was submitted in December of 2017. Yes. And then, as I say, last week, we provided you with the more recent version from April of 2018. Correct. Yep. And you've looked at, perhaps we might just bring this up. Can we bring up tab three of Mr. Curry's, the exhibits to Mr. Curry's statement? It should be exhibit PGK-3. Do you want a document ID? It's WIT.0900.0003.0290. And if we go to page five of the document, I'm sorry, numeral five rather than Roman number five. It's dot zero two nine nine. Thank you. We can see here the definition of what is a small business and the tracking indicates the change between December 2017 and April 2018. Yes. And so in, in part there's been a movement since December 2017 to reflect your recommendation that the employment test just be 100 full-time equivalent employees? Yes, correct. And I want to ask you then about the other two elements of the test. The first is element C, which is the $5 million limit. That's, that's obviously less than the five, I'm sorry, $3 million limit. That's less than the $5 million limit that you recommended. Well, it's less in two ways. Firstly, a smaller number, but secondly, that it, it is uh, intended to take into account all the loan exposures of the small business <coughs> rather than the facility that's in question. And all loan exposures, not only to the particular credit provider, but to any credit provider. Indeed, yeah. So significantly different to what we recommended. Yes, yeah, significantly different to the recommendation that you had made, which is that the monetary limit is $5 million for the particular facility, is that right? Correct. Okay. And then there's also subparagraph A, an annual turnover limit that is not something that you'd recommended? Uh, correct, yeah. That's... And do you have a view about the incorporation of this annual turnover limit? Look, I think it complicates the definition. Um, in various times over the last few years, in a number uh, of, of uh, arguments been put to us that the turnover test is, is too onerous uh, for banks to administer. Um, clearly, uh, that's not the case in other countries. A turnover test is, is not uncommon. Um, but we had not recommended it because we thought it was just unnecessarily complicated and sort of made... There are practical issues about that for someone like the Financial Ombudsman Service, for example, or AFCA now, uh, of having to decide what the turnover is and obtain uh, evidence about the turnover through tax returns or some other means, uh, making the process of figuring out whether a small business is in or out lengthier and, and more complicated. And to figure it out, as at the time, they were borrowing the money indeed. in the first place. Yeah, indeed. And that criticism of complexity then, does that also apply with respect to this $3 million in total debt to all credit providers? Look, I think so. I um, mean, I think it could... It could if, if you go back to the original premise that the code uh, is a promise from uh, the banking industry to its customers, in plain speaking language that will engender trust, uh, my recommendation is that you would say it sim more simply than that. 
And I think in your, in your statement, you were contemplating a slightly simpler question, which is what would happen if you just moved from $3 million for the facility up to $5 million for the, as a facility limit and what the effect on that would be? This is at paragraph 17 of your statement. Uh, 17 of my statement. Sorry, I'm going to need to refresh my memory on that. That's right. I'm sorry, it's now moved to be paragraph 18 of your 18 May statement. Oh, yes. So I think you explained two things there. The first is that your proposed definition was something that you thought would have a relatively small effect, extending coverage to an additional 10,000 to 20,000 businesses. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that you took the view that the comparatively minor concessions to fairness that the code represents would not substantially alter the balance of power between a $900 billion bank and a business with a few million dollars of financing. Could you just explain to the Commissioner what you meant by comparatively minor concessions to fairness? Look, uh, most of the concessions that the, that the code talks about are providing notice, providing information, um, uh, providing access to external dispute resolution. Uh, these are things that I, th you know, our assessment of community expectations is simply um, uh, f around fairness. It's not tilting the balance of power uh, dangerously away from the banks. So that we didn't think the concessions were so enormous uh, that um, that the argument that this would be would be grossly unfair to banks was particularly compelling. Uh, in terms of our estimate for how many additional businesses it would cover, that's a quite a difficult thing to do, as no doubt you've noticed looking at the statistics, but uh, on, the, on the information that the banks gave us at the time, that was our guess about how many additional businesses would be scooped up by that change. And did the banks suggest to you that it would be a significant number of businesses that would be affected if they moved from three million to five million? Uh, look, that wasn't a bone of contention, so the information was provided to us. The banks had a chance to review what we had said in the report and didn't take exception to it. And is that 10 to 20,000 businesses, is that based on the simple premise of a facility limit of $3 million versus a facility limit of $5 million as... Uh, it was, say, it was five. Our estimate was, looking at the stats that we could find, uh, was that about that many extra businesses would be scooped up if you made it a $5 million facility. Now, we did not... That was uh, at the stage of um, uh, thinking about it in terms of a simple test for the facility rather than the more complicated test that's been put forward. Yeah, and the, more comp the particular part of the more complicated test that you're referring to, I'm assuming, is the... $3 million in total debt yeah. from all credit providers. Yeah. Yeah. Which would and be the turnover question, which again, we, we couldn't find any useful uh, statistics to help us with that at the time. Thank you. I want to move then to the second topic that I want to explore with you, which is your consideration of responsible lending to small businesses. And the code, as you at the time you were reviewing it, the 2013 code, contained an obligation in clause 27 on a signatory bank to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and forming an opinion about the ability to repay the credit facility. Yes. And as you note in your statement, it's that's not the same as the responsible lending provisions provided in the National Consumer Credit Protection Act? Correct. Yeah. And those provisions in the National Consumer and Credit Protection Act don't apply to a loan entered into for a business purpose? Correct. Yeah. And you explain in your statement that one of the things that you considered as part of the review was whether Clause 27 struck the right balance between, on the one hand, access to credit and, on the other hand, responsible lending? Yes. And can you just help us or help the Commissioner to understand what's the 
First, what were the views that were coming from small business representatives to you about that? This was a very important issue for them. The, the uh, access to credit is, is uh, certainly priority number one put to us by the representatives of small business that we spoke to. And um, while they uh, wanted, were also interested in some protections for business, uh, they in particular did not want to import a, an onerous responsible lending obligation that would cause access to credit to dry up. So there was a big issue about whether that was the correct balance or not. And um, uh, we were urged by uh, most of those representatives to um, not to uh, not to overdo recommendations in terms of responsible lending. That is most of the small business representatives not yes. to overdo it. Yeah. All right. And what was the view that was expressed to you by banks about that? Look, I think the banks were in furious agreement with the small business reps on that front. Um, we put to them some issues about accessibility and, and uh, understanding from small business um, and, uh, and so on, but I think they had the same view that their preference was that, that whatever uh, protections were put in place would not uh, materially change the uh, access to credit for small business. And there was a submission made to you by CPA Australia in relation to Lenny. Could you just explain yes. that submission to the Commission? Look, I think the CPA also thought that um, that was a critical issue for small business. So that they didn't uh, differ from... I'm having to, to do this from memory. They didn't differ from the rest of the small business uh, submissions put to us in terms of that access to credit. Uh, they were much more concerned about the... Um, conduct of the loan during its course uh, and uh, if there was a need to vary any conditions, what would happen at the end of the loan, what would be the uh, conditions for rollovers of, of credit facilities and so on. So that, that was the, from my recollection, that was their focus. And in the end then, what was the view and recommendation that you formed about responsible lending? Look, our view was that firstly it was quite inaccessible to, to talk to most small businesses in terms of, uh, you know, what a diligent and prudent banker would do was pretty meaningless, as far as we could see. Um, probably the second biggest issue that small business put to us was the fact that they couldn't understand, they found it inc incredibly difficult to understand bank procedures, uh, legal terms that banks would use, contract provisions and so on. So some you know, a move to some plain speaking in that space was clearly a priority. So we thought we could, you could do, you could certainly do something around that, provide them with with better assistance. We also thought that the responsible there was some risks in the way the code operated at the moment on responsible lending because uh, it, it didn't actually spell out the sorts of tests or work that a bank would need to do to be a diligent and prudent banker. So we thought the code could helpfully do that in plain English. Uh, and we were also concerned about guarantors. So it was put to us by a number of people, and we, we again, we did, were unable to find real evidence for this, that um, banks were relying too heavily on the presence of a guarantor's assets and not doing sufficient homework on the underlying sustainability of the business loan. Um, in the, and the argument was that the banks were happy because their risk was attended to by a mortgage over someone's house or some, some other kind of asset and uh, were not being as diligent as they ought to be around the uh, assessment of the, of the loan, underlying loan itself. So again, we, we wanted to do some work around the guarantor provisions because we think that's a you know, particular vulnerability. And we'll come to the guarantor provisions in a moment, but you made, a, you made general recommendations about what was clause 27 of the of the code and can you just explain to the commissioner what was the in terms of the recommendations that you were making what was the idea what were the things you were trying to achieve well uh, so that the, the clause would be written in a way that small business could understand what the, what the code would offer them in terms of of the obligations on the bank uh, when they were framing a loan or making an offer in that space um, some more sp uh, specific setting out of the work 
that uh, the bank would do to assess the loan, some provision of information to the small business around what the bank had considered uh, and if they uh, were refusing a loan to provide, um, you know, provide reasons for why the loan was, was refused. And that, I should just clarify, that Clause 27, as it was, it wasn't, it wasn't limited to sm small business lending, was it? Uh, no, that's that's right. I mean, that, that's been a sort of an issue throughout with which which parts of the code are specifically written to um, for small business and which are not. But I'll have to refresh my memory, I'm afraid, on uh, on our recommendation. Do you have the page reference there? Uh, I don't think we've got the 2013. No, I meant, I meant in my report. That's, oh, yeah. that, that's right. Why don't we deal with this in a different way, which is if we bring up tab three of the exhibits to your statement, which is the one we were looking at a moment ago, which is wit.0900.0003.0290. And go to page 13 of that document, which is .0307. And so th this is part of the new draft code that's currently being considered by ASIC. And you've, yep. had, a look at, you've had a look at this. Yes. And the, perhaps if we start with a, a general point, this sets out a responsibility in relation to lending, not only to small businesses, but also to individuals. It's all dealt with under the one section. Yes. Yeah. And it appears to impose the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker test to a number of different well, both to individuals and also to small businesses. Yes. But then it contains a specific provision in Clause 51 about assessing appropriate circumstances. Yes. And are you able to tell the Commissioner, from your perspective, is this a move towards what you had in mind in yeah. your report? Yes, it's, 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 it, it at least sort of sets out what uh, is expected of the... Uh, um, diligent, prudent banker test. Have I got that in the right order? Um, so, look, it's a step in, in the direction we recommended. We would have preferred to see much more uh, specificity in there, sort of setting setting out more clearly what the bank would do, but that is a step in the right direction. And you'll see, though, there's an additional part that deals with the resources of third parties. Yes. And do you have a view about that? Yes, yeah, so, uh, we think that's a backward step, that, that in effect, on our read of it, it provides the banks uh, with uh, you know, clear authority to take into account uh, a range of third party resources in, in um, how they will assess um, you know, the, the viability of the loan. Uh, in a practical sense, I guess, they've been doing that in any event. Um, my suspicion is that that is in there to put beyond doubt their ability to rely on the guarantee. And that's how I read it at any event, I should. And in terms of your, based on your consideration and an evaluation of what sort of test might be applied by the diligent and prudent banker, is that something that you expected to continue to form part of the consideration? Look, I think it, it, it should. This is a question of trying to strike the right balance between relying on and being able to bring in a guarantor's uh, assets as a, as a risk management uh, mechanism, but uh, not to the extent of, of not paying enough attention to the, the affordability and sustainability of the underlying loan. So, um, and it's a difficult thing to strike the balance exactly right on. Uh, small businesses will tell you when they start up, there isn't any other way that they can get uh, get a loan without having some security that the, the bank can rely on because they have no track record, um, no cash flow records, no tax returns to rely on in terms of viability of the business. So uh, the need for... Um, you know, reliance on guarantors' assets is there. This is set out in a, I think we think it's set out in a way that um, is really designed to protect the banks. And I wanted to just 
make sure we distinguish between two things. One is the the assets of the guarantor, which might be offered up as security. The other is the income of the guarantor, which might be relevant to servicing the loan. Yes. And do you have, or did you have any expectation, or have any expectation, as to rel as to whether or not the income of the guarantor would be factored into assessing the serviceability of the loan? We, we think that's, uh, we argued against that. that our, our view was that the, um, f unless there were sort of unusual circumstances, the, the income shouldn't be taken into account unless the person was actually a co-borrower and getting a benefit from the loan. Um, but again, we accept that it is, it is a, uh, a difficult uh, area to, to be entirely precise around in terms of those sort of resources. It, a guarantor may put up an asset, but in the event that it's called on, may prefer to, uh, to satisfy the security by some other way, uh, and that might be through their um, income. They might be able to negotiate a solution like that. So <laughs> while we didn't want to you know, rule out every possible arrangement, we did want to have a code that said we will deal with this in a way that makes it clear where the priority should be in terms of responsible lending. I want to move now to the topic of, specifically the topic of guarantors. You considered the protection of guarantors under the code? We did. And did you hear from any particular groups or public advocacy groups about the problems of parental guarantees? Very many uh, submitters raised the issue of, of family guarantors. And what was the particular issue that was raised with you? Uh, really, guarantors uh, offering up uh, their guarantee without understanding the risks. Uh, in, in the extreme end, this could be a, a product of abuse, elder abuse, familial ab ab abuse. Uh, in fact, even the uh, guidelines that the banks have put together for this uh, alert uh, bank staff to the possibility of coercion in um, obtaining guarantor uh, guarantees for, for someone else's loan. Uh, so this was clearly an issue. Uh, it's also, you know, with, without necessarily crossing over the line into abuse, it's very clear that people were wanting to help family members or associates and getting themselves uh, into a highly risky position that they were not clear about uh, as a result of, of um, you know, goodwill. And one of the things that you considered was whether the, whether the signatory banks should be required to or obliged to do more to have potential guarantors obtain independent legal and financial advice? Yeah. So uh, we wanted that um, strengthened uh, and the code, uh, the new draft code certainly goes a fair way towards uh, strengthening those protection for guarantors. So there's a three day cooling off period proposed, uh, better information provided to the guarantors prior to signing up, uh, commitment to providing uh, information to them uh, of any underperformance of the loan during its life um, and providing them with some um, with, with a um, assurance that uh, should the guarantee be sort of called in that the, or the loan be called in that the banks would begin with the borrower's assets uh, and uh, rather than going straight to the guarantor's assets so I'm not sure if that's exhaustive but that was the intention. And sorry, I, if we just break down that last point, your, the issue was that the bank might call on the guarantee and the property that secured the guarantee before it actually called on the assets of the borrower. Was that Correct, right? yeah. And there might be practical reasons why the bank wanted to do that because it might think that the guaranteed property would cover the entire value Indeed. of the loan. So, so sometimes... Uh, it, sometimes there would be no alternative. The borrower may not be able to be found, for example, um, but or the borrower has no assets or has been made bankrupt. Uh, so there's lots of reasons why the bank may need to go to the uh, guarantor, guarantor's assets or security, but the, um, we wanted to make sure that the code um, 
set that out as a um, second resort rather than the first. And in terms of your view about the new code, do you have a view then as to what extent it picks up those things? Look, I think it's gone a long way towards those. I mean, there are still some things in there that we would, um, you know, <laughs> I would would rather were, were framed, you know, slightly differently, but it does go a long way towards, uh, towards the sort of guarantor protections that we wanted in the code. One of the things that we were talking about a moment ago is this idea that the banks ought to encourage guarantors to go and seek independent legal and financial advice. And I'm wondering if you have a view whether there were submissions made to you about what would actually be involved or what is necessary necessarily involved in a guarantor getting proper independent legal advice. Look, the code sort of sets out uh, a few um, safeguards in terms of signing the documents, not in the presence of the borrower, uh, a few other uh, provisions like that. The, pr the problem with the legal and financial advice issue is that at, at the beginning when the loan is being contemplated, uh, far too often, particularly if it's a family member, people are, are unwilling to seek that advice. Uh, they would prefer to take the sort of optimistic view uh, that's been put to them by their family members and so on. So there's, there, I'm told there's quite some resistance to seeking that advice from guarantors. While they can be encouraged to do it, uh, at this stage there's no compulsion. I wanted to move then to... Just before you do that, you spoke of uh, uh, the uh, changes in the code providing for better information being given to potential guarantors before they signed up. Mm. Can I understand better than I now do what the changes were? What, what was the better information that... Uh, is proposed. Okay, well, let me just... Uh... Would it help if we brought up the sure. new yeah, code? That, that would probably so help. If we yeah. go to wit.0900.0003.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
and that was the, the recommendation that the code explicitly say that if the uh, guarantor provisions had not been adhered to, the loan could, the guarantee could be set aside, that it would no longer apply. And Financial Ombudsman Services' uh, argument for that was, although it, um, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, the argument was that there needed to be a very serious consequence for the banks in order for them to adhere to the guarantor provisions religiously. Um, the banks were opposed to that. I think they, it, um, uh, you know, didn't take account of causation, and so you could have an environment in which some minor uh, breach of the code guarantor provisions resulted in the entire liability being set aside, which they thought was unfair um, and would be gamed by some customers. Um, we made the recommendation in any event uh, because we thought um, it was a, um, an issue that deserved to be uh, considered by the banks and put in the domain. So that was the main one that we didn't, um, that didn't appear in the code afterwards, the main provision. Is the guarantor given any information about why the bank is asking for third party support? The bank's uh, saying to the borrower, I will lend, but only if you give third party support in the form of a guarantee. Either an unsupported guarantee or a supported secured guarantee. Does the guarantor know why the bank is asking for third party support for the loan? That's not specifically re requested in the, in the drafting of the code as it is now. And so that bears upon what legal advice uh, can be given. Mm -hmm. uh, the lawyer who is confronted by the would-be guarantor, uh, if it happens, and I understand there's a big caveat about if it happens, the would-be guarantor sits there and says, should I, should I not enter this? At least there's an available point of view that question one for the lawyer would be, well, why is the bank looking for third party support? Unless I know that, how can I tell you whether you should or shouldn't? Uh, look, I would have to, it's not specifically identified. Uh, it wasn't in our recommendation, nor is it in the current code. Um, I think the, um, I would have to check. It's, it's possible that other provisions in the code would would oblige that information to be provided. Uh, Can I just help you out with that, Mr. Curry? If sure. we go to page 0314 in the document on the left-hand side of the screen. So this is, you see the heading guarantee documents and there's clause 99 and it sets out what documents have to be given in relation to the borrower. And you see subparagraph E requires the bank to give to the guarantor any financial accounts or statements of financial position that the borrower has given in the previous two years for the purpose of the guaranteed loan. And subparagraph F requires the latest statement of account. But then you see subparagraph G yeah. is the other information we have about the guaranteed loan that you reasonably request, but we do not have to give you our internal opinions. Our opinions yeah. So that on a, I'm really just <laughs> putting this to you, you can agree with it or disagree with it, but certainly as it appears, you, you hadn't made a recommendation that dealt with the specific nuance of the issue that the Commission has raised. That's the no. first thing. Correct. And the particular piece of information, which is the basis upon which the bank has made its decision that it requires the guarantee, appears to be something that is left at the bank's option as to whether it would have to be required and only if it was requested. Indeed. I think that's correct, yep. Commissioner, did you want to ask any further questions about guarantees? Yes, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Can we move then to the issue of loan contracts and simplification, which is another issue you raised in your review? And 
Do you recall what were the issues that were raised with you by small business representatives about the simplification of loans? Well, uh, first one is that documents at the time were described as <laughs> impenetrable and, and uh, far too difficult to understand the, the uh, impact of each of the clauses. So I think that was a sort of a, uh, a first principles issue put to us. The second one, uh, which has been raised with other reviews, is the um, small businesses uh, horror at discovering the extent to which banks could unilaterally vary contract terms. Um, and uh, probably another dimension of that was the extent to which um, small business borrowers were uh, shocked to discover that the extent to which non-monetary clauses could be breached and cause uh, trigger sort of uh, default action or uh, unilateral variations to the terms of the of the loan, so increased interest rates or demands for more information, other other sort of obligations, and they were they were probably the main ones put to us about that. And then there was another set that that come to bear in terms of the end of the loan, if you like, um, the sorts of things that might happen at the end of the loan. Well, if you take the first issue, which is simplification and making them impenetrable. You made a recommendation as to what yeah. should be done to try to address that. And could you just explain sure. to the Commissioner what the recommendation was? At, at the time, um, as part of the unfair contract uh, legislation being introduced, the banks assured us that they were redrafting, you know, in consultation with ASIC, they were redrafting uh, their standard uh, small business loan contracts and that they would come out much simpler and easier to understand, um, which we took them at their word for. Uh, we did add in one recommendation on that, which was to, to require a short form summary of the key aspects of the loan contract that that would be in one place and a um, one or two page takeaway for the for the small business person where the critical dimensions of the loan were set out in simple language for them. Um, so that was one other one around that very first um, issue of, of understandability, I suppose. And we'll bring up the clause in a moment, but I, just to focus on the issue of understandability, one of the other issues that was raised with you was understanding why finance was refused. Was that right? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. And so if we bring up again on tab tab 3 wit.0900.0003.0290, and go to page dot zero three one zero. And we blow up first clause 73. That seems to be the implementation of that first recommendation you were talking about, about yeah. having some simple summary. Yes. And yeah. do you have a view about whether that meets the requirement you're after? Look, it's a step in the right direction. We were a little bit concerned about the proposition that it'd be a separate document or part of the loan document. Um, I've had no chance to sort of test the intent of, of the codes clause. Um, and so that may or may not be successful. I'm assuming that the intention there is to allow each bank to have some flexibility about how they implement. So it's a step in the right direction. And then as to the issue of explaining why finance was refused. That was something you also made a recommendation. We did. Yeah. And what was the recommendation that you made? That, um, and this was something asked for by the small business um, advocates, that if a bank refused a loan, an application for a loan, they should provide the, the applicant with enough information for them to understand why it was refused and without a promise of, uh, uh, of providing a loan in different circumstances give the the applicant an idea of what would have to be improved in order for the loan to be successful, the application to be successful. And if we blow up clause 74 of the proposed new code, that seems to be adopting that recommendation. Yeah, so it's a bit of a sensitivity with the banks about just how much information they'll provide at the, at the end of that process. Um, 
I take exception to the language probably, but I think it is, yes, uh, uh, adopted. And sorry, when you say we, you take exception to the language, what do you mean by that, Mr. Look, Carroll? I just don't think that, um, uh, I, I think small business reading that would, would treat it as weasel words, really. Um, if appropriate, general reason why, so on. Well, I mean, we did urge the banks to try and be as plain speaking as possible in all of this and not to guard against, you know, rare occurrences that, that yeah, might be... It's a bit hard to require the bank to say, we don't trust you. <laughs> I mean, at some point, a bank has got to make a judgment about the customer. Of course. And uh, there may be cases where that's the real reason. Indeed. And we understand that that would be the, be the case sometimes. Now, the, the second issue you raised before in relation to the simplification of terms and the drafting of terms was the issue of unilateral variations. And you made a recommendation about unilateral variations. We did. Uh, do you have that there? To... I can do that, but might I just bring up the actual draft code so that we can okay. just have a look at that and you can tell us a view about that. That's in the same document, page.0321. So this is chapter nine dealing with when we change our arrangements yep. and as you'll see in clauses 152 and 153, there's provision for changing interest rates. And, yeah. and otherwise then there's separate provisions dealing with what are referred to as unfavourable changes. Unfavourable changes, yeah. Look, um, we, we uh, this is an area where I think uh, we didn't we didn't do as much as we should have done in, in this sort of question of unilateral variations. So we, um, again, there were changes afoot at the time, but I think as I look back on it now, I, um, I think we've probably uh, not done as much as we could have in the area. So we've ended up with a, with a provision that says we'll give you plenty of notice, but you, we can still unilaterally vary the terms uh, of the contract. Um, and I suspect that's an area where I, th I would like to have had my time over if I'd understood how it would all land. I understand. And then the last point that you raised then was about enforcement of loans and I think you were referring specifically to non-monetary defaults, is mm. that right? Yeah. And what were the issues that were raised with you by small business people about non-monetary defaults? Uh, well, aggra aggravation that um, what they saw as, as possibly minor variations in the non-monetary terms resulting in, in quite significantly adverse changes to the terms of the loan, so interest rates being uh, increased or calling in the loan in an extreme environment, demands for qu quarterly or monthly extensive financial reporting. Um, those, those were the sorts of uh, issues that um, uh, had been raised with others and were raised with us in terms of the um, non-monetary default uh, provisions within the contracts. Uh, the small business ombudsman, prior to the release of our report, had come out with her recommendation that um, this be, you know, dramatically scaled back in terms of, um, you know, what what um, whether default action could be taken I as a result of non-monetary um, breaches of the contract terms, um, and um, in the end, we made a recommendation that was consistent with with hers. And just explain, what was that recommendation, if you explain was that? that, that, that uh, other than illegality, uh, there should be no grounds for defaulting a loan provided the borrower was continuing to pay their, uh, make, meet their payments. Although, uh, was there a qualification about specialist? Uh, and specialist lending? finance, yeah. yeah that's and, right. and just so the Commissioner can understand that, that might mean, for example, property development finance or something <coughs> like that? Yes. 
And I want to then ask you about your view about how the draft code has implemented that. So if we go to page dot zero three one one. You'll see clause 80 begins, if you're a small business and you have met all your loan payment terms, we will not take default-based action against you unless, and then there are 12 sub-paragraphs of exceptions. Yeah. What, what's your view about the extent to which this lines up with the recommendation that you'd made? Look, um I suppose uh, uh, I was initially pretty concerned about the, the way that's framed. I think that's a, that's a classic example of the way in which the language and the framing of the code is, is small business unfriendly, if you like. Um, so that was the sort of first, uh, I don't have a solution for it, of course, yet, but um, uh, having, having read that, I think that was my sort of first reaction to it, as this would, would read badly as a small business uh, uh, customer. Um, and I think the the array of provisions there, on my read, and again, I'm, I am not a lawyer, but on my read of it, it, it looks as if there's uh, an enormous discretion for the bank to use one or other of those um, circumstances to justify um, taking default action. It is qualified by Clause 83, which says it's only if it's material or was reasonably yeah. considered to be material yeah. that it's to be relied upon. Do you have a view about that? Look, I think it's a, it's a, it's a step in the right direction to use the word material. Um, and I think uh, that was a, a bone of contention from a number of the small business people that we spoke to was that they, you know, had a, uh, they felt that some of these things were not material and were being used um, uh, to the bank's advantage. Thank you. Unfairly used at bank's advantage. And I might just ask you about two or two further questions. The first is, have you considered or did you consider any overseas examples in in considering the code? Look, we, um, we, we did some uh, research on, on what was available overseas. The three examples that we found most useful were the Canadian, Irish and UK uh, lending codes. And uh, they were part of our... Um, they influenced us in terms of, of um, arriving at the conclusion that the code could do much more in this space. So... Um, the, I think it's the uh, the UK lending code to begin with. That one was uh, has sections in it that are much more sort of clearly directed to uh, small business, uh, identifying what's what applies to small business within that code. Uh, it directly addresses the issue of financial difficulty difficulty for small businesses. Um, the other two codes are directed. Uh, directed only at small businesses, uh, and so they um, apply for lending for small businesses. The Irish, the Canadian code is very short and requires the, each bank to come up with its own mo code based on the model. The Irish code is much more extensive. Uh, its main focus is on financial difficulty and how a, how a business could be dealt with uh, when it's under financial difficulty. So we th they spoke much more directly to a small business customer, and. Um, and so we, um, you know, drew some comfort that our recommendations were um, uh, had been applied in other areas, and, and we, you know, copied language and such like from it. And do you, having had the chance, although as it turns out, not a very long chance, to review the most recent version of the code being considered by ASIC, do you have a view as to the extent to which? It reflects the recommendations you made, but also achieves the objects that you understood it was designed to achieve? Look, overall, I think it's a big step forward. It's a mix of things from my point of view. Um, uh, some, some excellent, some very good, and some where I'm a little disappointed about it. But I think overall, it's a, it's a, a, a big step forward in terms of how it's framed, its accessibility and language. Um, and the substantive protections that are proposed under it, 
I think you'd have to concede that it was, um, um, you know, a substantial step forward. Commissioner, I have no further questions. Thank this you, witness. Mr. Hodge. Does any party with leave to appear seek leave to cross-examine Mr. Curry? No. Very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Curry, for your evidence. Uh, you may step down. You're excused. Now, uh, we have a video link at two. Do we, Commissioner? Mr. So Mr. We Hodge, adjourn until then. Two o'clock.